are doing? Doing good? Awesome. Look great. Grab your Bibles. We're going to uh, be in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. And, and as far as that video goes, just go. All right? And if you don't want to, then just go. And then uh, when you get back, we can talk about it. Uh, just trust me. Trust me. Trust me. Um, I'm not going to beat you up over that. I'll beat you up over other stuff to, this time. So grab your Bibles. Genesis chapter 22. If you've been, if you grew up in church, been around church, um, uh, you, you may have heard of this one before, but we're going to maybe unpack it in a way that, that, that maybe you haven't um, thought of before. Um, I've entitled tonight's message, Daddy Issues, so some of you just need to clue in just for the title. Um, but we're, gonna, we're just going to look at the, the sacrifice of, of Isaac. You know, we're in this, the third week of this series called Sovereign Legacy, and, um, and we've been following through the, the faithfulness of this man, Father Abraham, and how he has just this incredible man of faith, even when it doesn't make a lot of sense, and tonight's definitely one of those kind of, those kind of deals, and, um, and then what I, I, what I hope you do is, um, I hope you'll just lean in, because God might be asking you to do something, and it doesn't make sense to you right now, but one day it will. So we're just going to pick it up in chapter 22, beginning uh, in verse 1. Genesis chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. It says, after these things, and that's like the last two weeks of the sermon series, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. So real quick, I just want you to underline that word tested, because uh, sometimes people begin to think, like, if I love God and he loves me, then, then he would never cause me any pain or harm or confusion or anything like that, that God would just love me and he would give me health and wealth and happiness and those kind of things, and I've heard people talk about that stuff on television, and that's just altogether not true at all. Um, in fact, we see right here very, very clearly that God tested Abraham, that what Abraham is about to go through here, the internal turmoil that he's going to have to wrestle with actually comes from God. In fact, one of the things that I've heard from some of the most mature Christians I know, that some of the closest times they ever felt to God were some of the roughest times in their life, and they did not get to that place where they felt fully surrendered to God until they began to understand, you know what, I don't know if God gave this to me or not, but he sure did allow it. And when they began to see some of the toughest times in their life as being allowed by a sovereign God, it was in those times that they could actually lean in closest to God. Because I, I, I just tell you this, that there have been some times in my life where I've been tested, and I've told you this before, there's been times where I begin to, you know, I'm walking down the path and everything's going fine, and then I'm kind of starting to go through some mud and some muck and some mire, and it's not going awesome, and I'm saying, hey, God, help me, help me, help me, and God answers my prayer every single time, and he reaches down and he takes my hand, but most of the time, in my case, instead of pulling me up out of the mud, he goes, I'll be sure to help you, and he just drags me right through it. <laughs> And I'm going, I don't understand, God. That's not what I prayed. Maybe you didn't hear my prayer. <laughs> Let me say it again. And so one of the things you've just got to understand is that if God is a, is a good dad, like Jesus says that he is, then every good dad disciplines his kids. Every good dad disciplines his kids. And I'm not just making this up. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, listen to what the Bible says there. It says, uh, Hebrews 12, 6, For the Lord disciplines the one he, one he loves, and chastises every son whom he receives. For it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? And if you were left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. And so, again, I know with this many parents in the room, people choose to discipline their children in all kinds of different ways. My dad was here last week, and he was, he was an expert in discipline. But in his world, discipline really just meant punishment. That was like what discipline meant. And so I don't know how many times I heard from my, my mom, you just wait till your dad gets home, right? Poor dad. I mean, he was just like the executioner. That was his job. Didn't even know what happened. It was just like a sign. It was like a steel sign or a bunt sign or something. And he would just, he would take off his belt. Anybody have your dad? It was like a samurai belt ninja warrior. And then one, I've tried to do this now, and I've about ripped my pants sideways. It doesn't do it, but somehow he would go, and it would come out in one swoop, his belt. We use tools, weaponry in my house, all right? And again, I know some of you are like, we don't, we don't spank our Timmy. We know, okay, we know. <laughs> we know. And honestly, if you're my age, if you're 40 and up, we're just, 
some of you grew up in houses and you weren't spanked, and that's your problem. I mean, it just is. That's, that's your problem. Because we didn't get to just stand in the corner and think about it while we played Xbox. No, we didn't get to do that, okay? And so my dad would do this move, and I'd just think, oh, oh I'm so scared. And then I think it, so that he didn't kill me, he would send me to my room to think about it, okay? And I thought, I always thought as a kid, I thought he was out outside of my room waiting to come in my room just really being torn up inside. But now as a parent, I realize he was like watching the evening news until he just got his heart rate down to non-illegal rate. And then he would, and then sometimes he would do this too. This is just sick. You shouldn't do this. He would fold his belt over. Remember this thing? And you go, whoa, 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 what happened? He's not even in here yet. Scare me to death. Anybody with me? Who's with me here? That was your world? All right, okay. Look, and we turned out mostly okay, didn't we? All right. And then he would always lie to me, you know, you, you, you remember this one? Well, here's what my daddy would do. He's sitting on the bed next to me. He'd go, I would have to explain to him why he was disciplining me. And then sometimes he would give that real open-ended one. He would just say, son, is there something I need to know about? And I remember thinking, there's about four things you need to know about, but I don't want to go ahead and confess them all right here now. So why don't you go first, and then I'll just be honest about that one. So we kind of go that way. And then sure enough, I'd turn over and he'd wear me out. Now my, I, and, and here's the thing. I learned to cry early because it wasn't a number. It was just about when you cry, then he would kind of wrap it up. And so he'd be on the way back. I'm like, oh, well, I didn't learn my lesson. Now my brother, my younger brother, who's now on the SWAT team, so he was, it's like a genetic thing apparently. I mean, my poor old dad would just be like, <laughs> He would have to, like, tag team a neighbor or something. He'd about to have a heart attack. Because my little pit bull brother was just like, I ain't crying. And I'd be like, for the love of Jesus, just cry, Russ. You're going to give daddy a heart attack. So when I was growing up, time out meant my daddy would have to take a time out, get a break, and then come back at it for, like, round two. So, And then I remember, I remember whatever age it, it shifted when, when we graduated from the spankings, I can't remember exactly. It's probably older than it should have been. But I remember my dad comes in and sits down. And I confess my sins to him. And I begin to assume the position. And he just says, no, no turn around, son. Let's just talk. And then, and then he just says, but I'm really disappointed. And I remember thinking, oh, dog, just hit me with a stick or something. Oh, my God. Come on, I'll hit you. Hit me back. Do something. Because at least when you hit me, I get to be mad back. But when you're just, when you're just disciplining me and not just punishing me. Oh, my goodness. So discipline isn't just punishment. In fact, discipline is not punishment. Discipline is coaching and correcting. That's what discipline is. And so sometimes correction includes some, some punishment in there. But correction is, hey, you're going the wrong way. Let's turn you to go the right way. And sometimes, just so we know not to continue to go this way, we let it sting for our own good so that we don't continue down that road and it just kills us altogether. So a little bit of a sting is way better. You know, just burning your finger on the stove is way better than burning up in your home while it's on fire. And it's not just correction, but it's correction and coaching. That's what discipline is. And so when we think about discipline as just punishment, you see, a judge punishes. A judge does not discipline because a judge does not have a relationship. So he just doles out punishment but a dad doesn't just punish a dad disciplines those that he loves it's why in the book of James it will say things like consider it pure joy my brothers when you go through trials of many kinds you know why because God's doing something in you as you're going through this time that you would never vote to go through on your own and what we're going to see here with Abraham and Isaac is something it's something that that just begins to mature Abraham's faith, and if we can begin to try when we're walking through those testing seasons of our life, understand that it, this is actually this is actually a part of the grace of God in our life and not His wrath. I, I've told you this before, but when I was in the, I think I was in the first grade, and my best friend Joey Peel was over at my house, we were riding bicycles, and we were riding in our in the road right in front of our house, and they just put in a new McDonald's in Dillon, and. Uh, you know, kids got to have somewhere to go to prom, so they put a McDonald's in. And so Joey and I are in my front yard just riding bicycles around in the front yard. 
and my mom comes out on the front porch, swings the door open, and screams my full name, Joseph Barry Martin the Third. you better, rah, rah, rah. she's just screaming at me, and you know, when you get the full name, you know it's bad. I remember yelling back, I would never yell back at my daddy, but I was a little bit braver with my mama, and so I would yell back, Mama, you don't love me, because you're yelling at me. And she screamed back, if I didn't love you, I'd let you ride your bike in the road. And then I'm thinking, okay, so I'm pedaling my bike over to the yard. Behind me, I hear my buddy <laughs> starting to cry. My boy, Joey Peel. I look back, I'm like, man, what's wrong with you? And he said, my mama lets me ride in the road. Okay. <laughs> it's true. So even as a first grader, you know, he understands is that a neglect from a parent means, hey, that's not love. Now, he just lived on a dirt road in a cul-de-sac. It wasn't like his mom was loving. But it's true in our lives, too. It is. And so this is coming from God, that after these things, God tests Abraham. And he says, Abraham, and Abraham says, here I am. In verse 2, and God says, take your son, your only son. Underline that part, we're going to come back to it. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Underline that part. We're going to come back to it. And go to the land of Moriah and offer, that word offer is a big deal too, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, by the way, so God comes to Abraham and says, take your son. Remember the one you waited 25 years to get? And this miracle son, this only begotten son, this son of the covenant, of the promising, of the promise that's going to bless the entire world that's going to be the, the precursor of many, many nations that are going to come from you. Yeah, that son that you love so much, your only begotten son, that son. I want you to take him to the mountain. I'm going to show you which mountain to go to, and I want you to give him up for me. Now, in this time in, in history, child sacrifice is very prominent. So that, that wouldn't have necessarily been um, totally out of context. But you've got to think in that moment, Abraham's thinking, oh, this doesn't make any sense at all, okay? This is, I mean, I've been waiting on this promise from you for a long, long time, so I don't understand, God. Why would you then want to take this from me? In fact, this son that I love that was your idea, this wasn't my idea. Remember, I was 100 years old. This is all your idea, and why would you just give it to me for a little while and then want to take it away? Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and he arose and he went to the place of which God had told him. Verse 4, and on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again. Now, here, it, there's a couple of things here. First of all, the incredible amount of faith that Abraham has in God. And if you'll remember, the whole deal about Abraham is not that he's a super awesome guy, but, but when we started out this whole series, we said that, that Abraham had faith in God and God accredited it to him as righteousness. So Abraham has pre-decided to put his trust in God regardless of the circumstances. And you want to talk about some circumstances. Because I'm going to tell you, um, if God told me to give up my only begotten son and it was going to somehow work out to save all y'all, I got bad news for y'all, because <laughs> I, I mean, I love you a lot. I really do. I love being the pastor of this church. I really love our church. I love who you are. I love who you're becoming. But if it's you or JP, I got bad news for you. You're going down, okay? But one of the things you'll see here is that when Abraham is talking to his, his servants here, you see, you see that Abraham has such a faith in God. He has such a belief in God. That somehow he fully believes, hey, we are going up on this mountain and we're going to come back. Like I, I trust God for who he is and what he's promised. And he promised that I was going to have a son. It took a long time. But he promised that. And he promised that I was going to be the father of many nations. And it was coming through this son. So I don't know how he's going to do it. But in this moment, it seems like he is asking for what is most important to me. And I'm always going to respond to God being first by bringing my first and best to him because he first loved me by giving me his best. Now, I don't understand the details, and this is the hardest. I mean, I can't imagine the emotional turmoil that he's going through here, but somehow in faith, he is walking this out and saying, God, I'm going to do whatever you've commanded me to do because I believe you are who you say you are and that you'll always keep your promises. 
So he's telling the servants, we're going, but we're going to be back. We're going to be back. You see, this isn't explicitly in the scripture, but I think that that Abraham knows, look, I'm going to surrender it all to the Lord. I'm going to hold nothing back from him. But I know somehow, I don't know how, but I know somehow God still has this in his hands. And he can be trusted even when I don't understand the details of it. And so he says, you stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. Verse 6, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took his hand, he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went, both of them, together. And then Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he says, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Now, I don't know about you, but when I was in and around church at an early age, it was always depicted to me like Isaac was like a little toddler boy, right? Like he's just kind of fresh out of a pull-up, you know, just this little tiny kid. But if you look at what the text says here, so he's carrying the wood for a sacrifice. He, he's got the cognitive ability to go, hey, Dad, we're missing something. I know we're going to go worship God. We're going to do a, a burnt offering there. We got the fire. We got the wood. We got stuff for the altar. There's just the problem is the sacrifice. Where is the sacrifice? And so Isaac here is, is you know, he's at least a teenager. He's not just a little toddler kid. And so... He asked this question, and this is a key question here, where's the lamb? Hey, Dad, where is the lamb? And here's Abraham's answer in verse 8. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And so they went, both of them together. Now, again, you see what Abraham believes. Abraham knows what God has called and commanded him to do even though it doesn't make sense to him. And yet, in obedience and in faith, he is just stepping out and walking in obedience to what God has called and commanded him to do. And even though in this moment, he can't, just, he can't give to you all the answers of how this thing is going to work out, but it's evidence here that he trusts that God is who he says he is and he'll always keep his promises. And so when his son says, here's the key question, where's the lamb? And then Abraham says, hey, listen, you just got to trust God's going to provide. God would not have called us up to the top of this mountain if he, if he wasn't going to provide the lamb. And yet Abraham knew what God told him is that, is that his son was going to be the sacrifice. And so, in faith, Abraham hikes up the mountain. Verse 9. And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. So not only is Abraham this incredible man of faith, but apparently so is Isaac. Because if Isaac is a teenager and can carry the altar wood up and carry the fire and carry the knife and understand. So if he's, he's like a teenage kid or so, or maybe older. And you remember, Abraham's got to be 110, 115, 120, all right? I don't know if you've wrestled a 120-year-old lately, but they are not that awesome, okay? And so what does this mean? Abraham may not have the physical ability to tie his teenage son up and so what does that mean that means that Isaac his son just like his dad trusts God his son trusts him and so Isaac is laid on the altar but he's got to be a willing participant here to do this so do you see how this is like Isaac Isaac's trust of Abraham is just another picture of our trust of our father when he asks us to do something that doesn't make sense to us in the moment. And so, Isaac gets on the altar, verse 10, and then Abraham reached out his hand and he took the knife to slaughter his son, verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And so you might ask, well, why? Okay, so why? that seems crazy. I mean, that's why we call it daddy issues. You think you got daddy issues? These guys must have been in counseling for the rest of their life, right? That no matter what, when Abraham be like, hey, Isaac, you mind cutting the grass? Hey, you mind not sacrificing me on the mountain? You know, remember that time? I don't have to do jack anymore, you know? Well, a lot of theologians will say, one of the, one of the biggest things they'll say is, is this was the definitive once and for all that 
child sacrifice has no place in, in Judaism or Christian theology. This would say, no, we don't do that. The pagan world may be doing that. We do not do that. Um, also, I, a pastor friend told me this one time, and I thought it was kind of brilliant. He said, he, I was asking him for advice as far as being the lead pastor of this church, and he said, he says, um, don't do what God told you to do. And I thought, well, that sounds heretical. He says, no, no, don't do what God told you to do. Always do what God is telling you to do. And he pointed to this, because what God told Abraham to do was one thing, but then God interrupted him and told him to do something else. And so obedience is always doing what God is telling you to do. And that a lot of times in churches, churches get a clear word from God back in 1953 to do something, and then they just continue doing that forever and ever until Jesus returns, and even though he tells them to do some new things along the way. And those two things are true, but that's not the main point. Here's, here's why this happened. Here's the most important part of, of Abraham and Isaac. Is in verse 13 and following. It says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. You underline those words, instead of his son. So first of all, this is a miracle, all right? I know this place is full of deer hunters. How many times have you ever been walking through the woods and be like, well, praise God. There's an eight-pointer caught by his horns in the thicket. Never, okay? It just doesn't happen, all right? And so, here's Abraham, sur fully surrendered to God. I'll do whatever you call me to do, even if it doesn't make sense to me. But I fully believe that, I don't know, if I go through with this, you're going to bring my son back. or I, Somehow, God, I know you're going to provide the lamb. And as he raises his hand, God says, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. And then... Just there beside him is a ram caught in the thicket. And he says that you sacrifice that ram instead of your son. This is a picture of the gospel. So listen, Church of 1122, for the next bunch of months, we're going to be walking through all of Genesis, all of Exodus. We're going to walk through lots and lots and lots of the Old Testament. And what I need us to understand always is this whole book, okay, the whole Bible from the very beginning to the very end is about one thing. It's about God's redemptive story for his people through Jesus Christ, his son, period. All the way back from the very first verse to the very closing prayer in the book of Revelation, the whole thing is about one thing, and it's about Jesus. And so what we see here in this, in this, in this account of Abraham and Isaac is we see this picture of the gospel. That here's a ram that is sacrificed Instead of, and so verse 14, and so Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided, verse 15, and the angel of the Lord called to Abram, Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, and now what the angel of the Lord is going to do is he's going to reiterate the messianic prophecy that he's already given to Abraham Many, many years ago, he says, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as stars of heaven, and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And then this is what applies to us so much, verse 18. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So here's a recap of what just happened, okay? Here's the recap. Here's a dad who loves his only begotten or firstborn son. He goes up on a hill. He surrendered his, his, his only begotten son. There's a substitutionary sacrifice, and because of that, the whole world is blessed. Sound familiar? You see, this is just, this is the gospel. This is the gospel. And so here's the point. If you want to look in your notes, here's the point. I, I didn't write it. God did. It's John 3, 16 and 17. Here's the point of Abraham and Isaac. The point is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And in your note, and even in your Bible, it's okay, all right, I checked. You should write the word begotten there, not just only, okay? Because the Greek word that gets translated one and only or only in our modern translations is monogene, or like one gene. It means of the same essence. We don't have a good word for that, but begotten, the old King James word, is a really good word for that. And so, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And so, here's, here's what I want you to look at. Um, we're going we're gonna to jump over to John chapter 3 and unpack it from, from the perspective of John 3.16 real quick. But a lot of times when people teach the, the Bible verses on Abraham and Isaac, the way it can come across is this. It comes across this way. Um, like if you really love God and if you really trust God, then watch out because he might ask you to give up what's most important to you in order to prove to him that you love him. Now, I would say um, not, that, that's not a great way to think about it. Okay. Now, he may come to you and say, hey, there are some idols in your life that you need to surrender, that you need to lay down. And, and anytime a good thing becomes a God thing, that's a really bad thing. Anytime you take anything temporary and treat it like it's eternal, then it's only God's grace and mercy that he would rip that out of your life. And there could be really, really good things. I can tell you one that lots and lots of Christian parents struggle with, and it is their children. That your children, actually, instead of you seeing them as, some, as a gift from God for you to steward for his glory and their joy, you can begin to see them as your God. And your entire world can get wrapped around in your children. And quite honestly, unless you're kind of a freaky parent, it's hard to tell when you're crossing in and out of those worlds, right? Because you just love them so much that you would do anything for them. Anything for them. And so anytime a good thing becomes a God thing, that's a bad thing. And it's idolatry. Um, oh, your church activity could be one of those things. Like church activity is a good thing, okay? I would like for you to be very active in all of our activities. I really would. And we actually think it will help you be closer to God. That's why we do these kind of activities. It's also why we don't do a lot of other activities, you know? If we try not to participate, we, we try not to offer a bunch of activities that we don't think will help you be really close to God, all right? We don't have a lot of bake sales. We don't have a bowling league. We don't have some of that stuff, right? We just, we try to get you involved in disciple groups and in serving and in mission trips. But if you're not careful, the activities that you're involved in at church could actually be the thing that defines you instead of your identity being in Christ and a good thing becomes a God thing, which becomes a bad thing. Because you think you're defined by the activities in your life instead of being defined by who Jesus is and who he says you are. So there are times when God will come and say, hey, listen, I, I just need to take this part of your life out because it's got too much control of you. That's altogether different than a good dad that loves you because a good dad that loves his kids doesn't just want to take his, the kids' favorite stuff. Like That's not the gospel. And let me just be honest. One of the things we talk about in our staff meetings a lot, I like to ask our staff, what part of the gospel has yet to penetrate your heart? And this is the part that I struggle with the most. Okay, personally, just personally. I get that Jesus died on the cross for me to forgive me of my sin. I'm, I'm in on that, all right? Substitutionary atonement, we're going to talk about it a lot in a minute. I get it, makes sense, theologically, doctrinally, legally, makes sense. The part I have a problem with, that I have a hard time receiving, is that he's just a good dad that wants good things for me. I still have this sneaky little whisper from the enemy in the back of my mind on a weekly basis that my life is so blessed right now that I better not get too used to it because at any moment, for the sake of a good church story, God is going to just jerk the rug out from under me just so I can prove that he's first in my life. That's just silly. See? That's just some of my own wretched, black-hearted sinfulness that is yet to be sanctified. So, so the point of Abraham and Isaac is not, and be careful, because if you really love God, here's what he's going to do. He's going to show up in your bedroom tonight, and he's going to make you go to the bathroom. You get Ebola or something, you know, just to prove it. Or whatever your favorite thing is, you better not let him know. Because that's what he's going to do. Does any parent act that way? I mean, any good, I know there's some weird ones, but any good parent act that way? Do you ever just walk in and see your child like, like in a healthy way, really enjoying something in their life, and you go, oh, I know. I'm going to prove I'm a dad or the mom, and I'm just going to take that from you. No, 
Now, if there's some things that you think are, are leading them in a way that's not healthy for them, then yeah, because, of, because you love them, you correct and you coach, you come in and be like, hey, we're not playing video games that much anymore, okay? You got to get in the sunshine. We live in Florida, all right? So you got to go outside. So there's some of those things, but because the truth is, if God wanted to take something from you, guess what? What's stopping him? If I want, I could go home tonight, walk into JP's room, take everything that he has, which I gave him, I could take it all, and there's nothing he could do about it. He could whine, and he could complain, and I could just <laughs> right in the head and just take all his stuff and put it in the front yard and put lighter flu- fluid on it and just burn it to the ground. Do you love me now? Not that much, right? So that's not the point. The point is not God saying, hey, I want to take what's most important from you so that you can have a chance to prove that I'm number one. That's not bad. It's actually the exact opposite. I, I want to look at it from this angle. What's actually going on here is that God loved you so much that he would give up what's most important to him, his only begotten son, for you and me. So we all know John 3, 16, okay? We all know it. Uh, even if you didn't go up in church, you go to a Jags game, there's always that one guy, no shirt on, John 3, 16, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, it's the verse Tim Tebow wrote, I think. He wrote it on his eye black, you know, and everybody Googled it and all that stuff. And, and, and we've taken it so far out of context in our evangelical world, a lot of times we miss so much of what was going on. So in John chapter 3, what's happening here is Jesus is talking to this Pharisee named Nicodemus, okay? And so Nicodemus, this Pharisee, is a very religious man, this Jewish guy. And since he was a Pharisee, he was like ultra religious. And Pharisees get a really, really bad rap in the New Testament, and most of the time they should. But the Pharisee's job, the word Pharisee means separated. And so what their job was, their job was to stay ceremonially clean so that when the Messiah showed up, they would be the first ones to recognize him. That was their full-time job. That's what they were supposed to do. So they didn't drink, they didn't smoke, they didn't chew, they didn't go with girls who do. Not just to be awesome, but so that when the Messiah, when the one, the seed of Abraham showed up to usher in the kingdom of God, that the Pharisees would be the first ones to go, here he is, guys, here he is. This is why we have been so ceremonially and religiously clean, we would not be polluted by this world, and we have the clearest eyes to be able to see. The problem was, is that... that um, Just like we were saying before, their church activity became their God instead of God being their God. And so when Jesus himself, when God himself shows up in the flesh, they couldn't see him because of all the rules that they had created in order to help them see him. So, Nicodemus, he shows up one night because he didn't want to show up in daytime because, you know, people might see him. And he comes up in John chapter 3 and he he asks Jesus, he, he, he knows he's a rabbi, he knows he's from God. And he's asking him some legitimate questions. He's like, Jesus, like, are you the one that they're talking about? And then Jesus begins to explain to him, and maybe you've heard this language before. Jesus begins to explain to him, unless you're born again, then you can't be saved. And Nicodemus is thinking only in the natural. And essentially, you've got to read it for yourself, but essentially Nicodemus, his response to that is like, ugh. That sounds gross. And he literally says, so, so I got to get my mom on the phone here? I mean, this is like a, like a, you got to do that again as a grown? And, and, and Jesus is like, oh, okay, okay, maybe I started over your head, all right? So that's the whole born-again conversation. Jesus is trying to explain salvation to Nicodemus, a teacher of the law, and he can't get it. So then what Jesus does is he drops back, and he's going to bring this down into a context that Nicodemus this studier of the Old Testament would understand. And now, so he does two things. He does two little rabbi tricks here in John chapter 3 that, you know, as Westerners, we would, we would never know. The first thing he did is, um, is that he, he's going to, um, anytime a rabbi would say uh, a significant word, then every, every real Pharisee or disciple would know the first time in Scripture that word's used. So when Jesus says John 3, 16 for the very first time, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's three big trigger words that would have happened in the mind of Nicodemus. Nicodemus would know um, 
The first time that phrase, only begotten son, was ever used, it was in Abraham's only begotten son, Isaac. Maybe that's what he's talking about. And especially since he said, uh, for God so loved the world. Because the first time in the Old Testament, or first time in the Bible, that the word love, like a father loving a son, is used, would be in Abraham loving Isaac. And the same word here in John 3.16, he says that he gave his son. Um, You could also... Offered his son would be a good translation, just like Abraham was called to offer up his son, Isaac. So as Jesus introduced this concept of for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Nicodemus immediately begins to go to, I bet he's talking about Abraham and Isaac, okay? Not only that, Jesus being a good traditional rabbi, um, Jesus loved to teach in threes. He loved to teach in threes, so maybe... You're familiar with like Luke chapter 15 where Jesus is trying to explain to everybody what kind of God we serve. And so he tells three parables back to back to back. Jesus was famous for taking three parables with one point and shoving them together. So he tells the parable of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. We call it the prodigal son. Okay, Or like in Matthew chapter 24 and 5 when the, when the disciples summon and say, Jesus, what, what's the end of the world going to be like? And so what Jesus does to try to explain a hard concept to them is he gives them three parables, but they're all really pointing to one thing. And so the three parables in Matthew 25 that he gives, he gives the parable of the virgins, it's don't miss out on the party before the return. He gives the parable of the talents, don't waste your time, get to work. And he gives the parable of the sheep and the goats, okay? One day Jesus is going to return and separate the sheep and the goats. And so what Jesus does here in John chapter 3 is he goes to his threes again. And so the first thing he does is once he begins to try to talk about this, um, you've got to be born again, and Nicodemus is clearly not getting the spiritual implications. So he drops back and says, okay, i got to go rabbi school because I'm talking to a Pharisee, and he begins to teach in threes. And so the first thing he does in John chapter 3 is he talks about Moses because who would know Moses better than a Pharisee? So as soon as Jesus starts talking about Moses, he's like, oh, okay, I'm starting to get on board with where you're going here. And so he says, it's just like, you remember, you remember Nicodemus back in the Old Testament when Moses held up the bronze snake and everybody that had been bitten or poisoned by a snake and they would look at that snake, then they would be cleansed or healed. Remember that? And, and Nicodemus would be like, well, of course I remember that. I mean, I'm a Pharisee. You know, I teach this kind of stuff around town. And Jesus is going, yeah, I'm like that. See, I'm going to go to the cross. Everybody in the world has been bitten by the snake and poisoned. And all who look up or surrender to me They'll be cured of the poison. It's like that. And then the second, the middle one that he's teaching here is John 3, 16 and 17 and 18. And so when he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Nicodemus knows, oh, I see what you're doing. You're actually teaching me about Abraham and Isaac. That's what he's doing. He's taking him back there. And so, because if you look at the account of Abraham and Isaac, in light of this verse, John 3, 16, I mean, it's really overwhelming. Think about it. Abraham offers his only begotten son. And at the cross, God offers his only begotten son. That Isaac carries the wood for the sacrifice up on top of a hill. And Jerry, I mean, Jerry, Jesus carried his cross. Although he might be the closest that Jesus ever met. But Jesus carries his cross for the sacrifice. That Isaac cries out to his father. Jesus cries out to his father. Isaac escapes death after three days. Jesus rises from the dead on the third day. Um, That Abraham indicated that God will provide a lamb for the sacrifice, and God provides the lamb as the sacrifice. That God provides a ram, which is a male sheep, as the substitutionary sacrifice, and that God provides male Jesus as the substitutionary sacrifice. That the ram was caught by its horns or its head in the thicket, and Jesus was crowned by a crown of thorns. That the sacrifice was offered up on Mount Moriah, and that Jesus is sacrificed up at Golgotha on a hill. And in this moment, if you're Nicodemus, you begin to go, oh, oh, I get it. You see, I thought it was just a story for children back in the day to talk about how important God was in your life. Is God the most important? And now, I think I understand. You see, what you're saying is that that ram was like, Jesus, and that that ram was the substitutionary sacrifice for me, right? And that's the point of John 3.16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes or trusts or commits his whole life into, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And you think, well, well, how does that work? Well, it works a lot like um, Abraham and Isaac did. You see, a lot of people kind of stop there, right? A lot of people don't know John 3, 17. It's a really important verse. You ought to keep going. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So the point is that God isn't just out to get you and prove you wrong, but God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus. Not to just actually do what kind of we're known for at church, just point your world, finger at the world and say, how dare you, but actually die in your place. But it keeps going. Verse 18 of John chapter 3 says, and whoever believes in him is not condemned. That's good news. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people who love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. In other words, every single one of us are born into this world. And we all know this well as 1122ers as wretched, black-hearted sinners. And I don't say that to us just to be mean, but I actually love you enough that I would tell you that. That all of us are born into this world with a problem, with a sin problem. And God is a holy God, and he is a just God, and he is a perfect God, and we are not. And even on our best day, even on our best day, the Bible says that our righteous deeds are like filthy rags to him. That when we bring those righteous deeds to God and say, well, God, you must be impressed with me now because look how good I did today. I mean, I came to church. I brought somebody with me. I'm going to bring somebody with me again, whatever it is. And God would say, yeah, but that doesn't do anything to take care of the sin problem that you have. And that sin does separate us from God. And because God is holy and because God is just, that our sin must be paid for. And then you and I, we have two options to pay for that sin. One option that rarely gets talked about is this, that you can self-atone for your sin. When the Bible uses the word atone, it just means to pay for, okay, to pay for. And self-atonement is an option. And self-atonement means this, that the way that you personally can pay for your sin is an eternal separation from an almighty God. You and I, especially if you grew up in church or been around church, we would know that as hell, okay? An eternal separation from an almighty God. That God would give you in eternity exactly what you asked for in this life. So if you would say, hey God, appreciate you dying on the cross and all that, but quite honestly, I don't need you, I'm going to do this myself. Then you've really condemned yourself, is what John 3, 18 is saying. That you already stand condemned. Because what you're saying is, um, God, I know I owe this debt, and, and anytime we sin against an almighty God, it requires an everlasting punishment. And so when we say... God, I'll take care of this myself. And you are condemning yourself to say, it'll take me all of eternity separated from you to pay for my sin. So that's one way to pay for it, self-atonement. What John 3.16 is about, what Abraham and Isaac are about, is what's called the substitutionary atonement. That you can take the substitutionary atonement. And everybody knows what a substitute is, right? I mean... Like when you have a substitute when you're a kid, there's a lot of atoning that we have to do for that, you know. And it's instead of, instead of you, that God sends his only begotten son to make payment for you. Now, that's usually the case where we go, but that doesn't seem very fair. I know, I know. That's why John 3.16 starts out this way. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that here's what he decided to do. That he made a way for me and you when it appeared that there was no way possible. Why? Because we deserve it? No. In fact, it's not about us at all. It's actually about God because he's first and he first loved us by giving us his best and then gives us the opportunity to respond to that by saying, okay, God. In order to receive your love, then I receive your son, Jesus Christ. That that's my response. And when you do that, then Jesus 
goes to that altar and is sacrificed instead of you and me. And so you could take John 3.16 and you could break it down this simple, okay? That God loved, so God gave. And if you believe, then you receive eternal life. It's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. Now, let me, let me talk to the Christian in you. Because any time in church we start talking about John 3.16... The people that have known that for a long time, that as soon as I went John 3.16, you could have said, well, I could, I could finish the sermon, you know? The gospel is something that we never, ever, ever, ever graduate from. That we just come back to over and over and over again. Because not only are we justified by Christ's death and resurrection, or not only are we adopted by that, not only are we um, made righteous by the gospel, not only are we uh, wiped clean by the gospel, not only do we become a Christian by the gospel, but it's also that same gospel that allows us to grow and to walk and to abide and to be closer and closer and closer and to have that kind of relationship with God where God does discipline us as a son because of the gospel, that the gospel corrects And the gospel, um, it allows us to, when we do stumble and when we do fall, not run away from him, but run back to him. Why? Because God loved, so he gave. And if I believe, and I remember a long time ago when I decided to believe, then I received eternal life. And some of you Christians need to be reminded of the gospel over and over and over, because here's what I know about you, because I read your prayer cards, or I talk to you on Facebook, or down here at the end of a service, some of you think that sometimes you sin after you've become a Christian and now it doesn't count for you anymore. As if God looked at you at some service here and says, okay, I'll offer you salvation, but then you sin on a Tuesday afternoon and he's like, oh, I didn't know, give it back, never mind. And that's why over and over and over and over, we respond to the gospel. By understanding that God loved, so God loved, so God gave. And if we believe, and remember, it's believe in, not believe that. If we believe, then we receive eternal life. I grew up in a culture that taught me that you had to do good things to appease a good God. And then when you die, you go to a good place. And I tried it. I mean, if you, if you grew up in Jacksonville, if you grew up Baptist or Catholic or most of the, those kind of denominations, you've been down that road, haven't you? Have you tried to obey some man-made list to make sure God wasn't mad at you, right? And, and quite honestly, where did it lead you? Total and complete frustration, right? And then when God doesn't come through the way you expect him to come through, It doesn't allow you to walk in a freedom that he's purchased for you. It just causes us to walk in this frustration, doesn't it? And when you look and be like, God, I don't understand. How come you're not blessing me? I've been obeying. I don't, you know, I don't get drunk like my stupid roommate and I'm not watching rated R movies and I'm, you know, I've made up my own Christian cuss words. Son of a biscuit. You know, that is glorifying to you. Why would you not? And you can run that for a little while. You can go outside in for a little while. But then over time, what happens? It's exhausting. I mean, it's just exhausting. That's why Nicodemus is talking to Jesus one night. Because he's run down that road before, and he's just exhausted. You know what the gospel, the good news of the gospel is? It's the freedom. It's the freedom to say, God, this is about you. It wasn't about me. Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world, that includes you, for God so loved the world that he gave, and if you believe, then you receive. So when I was a teenager, and I'd had a couple of years of trying to be good to impress the other, like, you know, kids in my church, Coach Bull Lee, the guy that led me to Christ, the the counselors at this little rinky-dink camp that I went to, They reenacted John 3.16. They reenacted the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. And looking back, 
they were no threat of winning any Emmy Awards or anything like that. It was a bunch of, um, you know, college students in, like, bedsheet togas acting out what happened in the gospel. And I'll never forget being there as a teenager in Bennettsville, South Carolina, and watching this unfold. And up to, my, up to that point in my life, I believed that there was a God, and I believed that Jesus was his son. But I never believed any of it. I never trusted any of it. I just believed that probably happened. And I'll never forget my counselor, this college student from Furman University, was hanging on the cross being Jesus. And he said, it is finished. And they had all these torches, and they doused them out in this pond, and then this light came on Coach Bully. And Coach Bully just said, for God so loved you, and he's pointing back to this cross. He said, God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, and that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. And so if there's somebody here tonight, would like to here's would like to ask Jesus into his heart. I wouldn't even use that last sentence, okay? But that's what he said. Anybody here that would like to ask Jesus into his heart, now's the time. And now this is a Baptist camp, so that on I think it's required by law to end with the song Just As I Am. I think Billy Graham wrote that into every Baptist bylaw that there were. And so we started singing Just As I Am, okay? ever been in one of those kind of situations like they don't stop you know they just keep going and keep going and there's always some kids at church camp that go up first you know they get saved every Thursday right there they go in there that's fine and I was sitting on my little I was on this little stool and I I literally I remember thinking well I am all right I might do this but I am not doing this in front of all these people I am not I'm not standing up and I ain't crying okay I've been flirting with this chick the whole week of camp, and I'm not ruining it on the last night by looking like a goober up there crying with everybody. I ain't doing that. And then, and I remember thinking too, there's got to be a lot of changes when I get home if I do this. Uh Uh-oh. And so I literally, I wrapped my legs around the stool I was sitting on, I sat on my hands, and I was like, I ain't standing up. And then on about the seventh verse of just as I am, the next thing I know, crying my face off in the chest of Coach Bull Lee, just saying, I want to be a Christian, right? And here's why. Because by the, by the wooing of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I began to understand for the very first time that God wasn't there flexing on me, saying, hey, I just want to take from you whatever you think is the best in this life. But he actually demonstrated his love for me by giving to me what was best in him, his only begotten son. And in that moment, I went from just believing that to trusting in it. And I became the son of the Most High God. The reason that we never leave the gospel here at the Church of 1122 is because as a son of God, you never leave the gospel. So I want to give you, some. there's some people in here that maybe for the very first time, you need to just not believe that, but believe in and trust. Not because God's here to try to take something from you, but because God gave something for you, His only begotten Son. And then Christians, there's a lot of you, there's a lot of you that need to be reminded, to be reminded that you don't graduate from the gospel. And when you do stumble and fall, the gospel gives you the right to run to Him. So just please know this, that God loved, so God gave. And that if you believe and trust, then you receive eternal life. Would you please bow your heads and close your eyes. And without any further explanation, if that's you, if you say, hey, Pastor Joby, just like you, when you were a teenager, tonight is the night, or today is the day, this is the time that I want to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. I believe in what Christ did on the cross for me. Would you raise your hand? And surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And those of you with your hands in the air, there's not like a magic prayer for you to pray. Then you just confess to God that you've been the Lord of your own life. And now you're ready for him to be your Lord. 
that you surrender and you trust and you will take the substitutionary atonement. You'll take what Christ did on the cross instead of your good efforts to pay for your sin. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you and I praise you for the gospel. God, I, I pray that as a church, God, that we never, ever, um, Lord, that we never get over the gospel. That we would be so moved by the fact that, God, you are love. And that even though by our very nature we do not deserve to be loved by you, God, you do love us because that's who you are. God, you are love. And in your love for us, God, you demonstrated it by sending Jesus Christ to bear the weight of our sin on the cross. And God, I just pray that, that all of us that know you would be reminded of that in this moment. God, even those of us that are currently struggling with some pretty serious sin in our world that killing us but yet we know in our deep in our heart God we believe in you that God you died for those sins too and that God because we continuously trust in you because we continuously trust in your death and your resurrection God that the chains would fall off and that we would be free to know you as a good dad so God I pray that there's salvation in this place but I, God I pray also for those who say well I am saved I have been saved that God you would continuously work out our salvation in us, God. And that day after day after day, we would get up and we would pick up our cross and we would follow after you. And I pray it in the good, strong name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Hey, would you please stand? Just like every week, we respond to the gospel. We respond to the gospel. That's what worship is. And so we respond by singing. We respond by um, coming down to the altar, if that's what you need to do. We respond by bringing our tithes and offerings to the offering boxes around or giving on your app or giving at the kiosk, however it is that you need to respond, let us do so.